You have the floor for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Deputy Kennedy, um, we've had testimony from many witnesses in this committee and two other committees, including from the former president of uh, the Green Slush Fund, uh, that there was an ADM in every board meeting where these votes were made. Uh, I believe for most of that time, uh, certainly while you were deputy, that was a now a retired public servant named uh, Mr. Noseworthy. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, who has replaced Mr. Noseworthy in that role? Mr. Chair, I, I, is it Charles? Charles is IS. Yeah. Nobody even specifically. I, I, I have, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll have to get back to you on that because yeah, sure. just to be clear for the member, um, you know, we, 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 this is an area we've been looking at deeply. Uh, and so, you know, work is underway to kind of renovate this role of the observer, and, and I'll have okay. to get back to you with the details, so, but I'm happy to so do that. So during that time, uh, and you, you said at the beginning that, you know, you take this, the department takes the management of these uh, issues seriously and that you, as the deputy, were only made aware of it when the whistleblower uh, came to you uh, and that the board decisions do, don't remove at arm's length, don't remove your department's responsibility and the expenditure of taxpayer dollars. Um, there are 186 instances perhaps with some overlaps, uh, uh, where you had an assistant deputy minister in the meeting where conflicts were declared, were partially done, the, and he testified uh, obtusely on those issues. Uh, were, did he ever, as a person responsible for overseeing on behalf of this department, ever report to you about what was happening uh, in the time that you were a deputy, because I believe you were appointed in September 19, or 2019. I think, Mr. Chair, what I would say would be on matters regarding the governance of the organization, you know, the buck stops with the deputy minister. It's why I'm here speaking. I don't think I'm in a position to talk about what individual employees did or did not do, just as a, as a kind of, frankly, no, basic matter of accountability and, and privacy. Okay. What I will say is we're in strong agreement with the Auditor General, and well, again, these are my words, I'm no, sorry, I, I don't have I, the report. I but, understand that, Deputy. Yeah. So um, if I could ask you then, um, you were appointed three months after Ms. Vacherian was put in charge as chair. Were you briefed that the, uh, that the president of SDTC had uh, informed uh, both the minister at that time, Navdeep Baines, and the ADM Noseworthy, who was going as a go-between, and the minister's office, that she had a conflict of interest and was not an appropriate appointment for chair? I became aware of these concerns that had been raised uh, contemporaneously with committee members. This is, I was not, uh, I was not deputy at the time uh, and was not involved in those No, but when you events. took over as deputy only three months I, later I, and got my, briefed my, on my, this. My awareness of these kind of historical events and the concerns raised, uh, I, I learned about these, I would say, at more or less the same time that okay. uh, the committee did. Okay, so on uh, Mar uh, March 30th, 2021, uh, SDTC Board Director Steve Kuchera uh, uh, had a project of which he had an equity interest in approved by the board for $8 million. That's following, and now that's in your time as chair, uh, as deputy. Uh, that follows $4.5 million that his company had an equity interest in, received money from SDTC before you were deputy. Um, so were you made aware by your officials that this director had received uh, an $8 million equity investment in the company. Mr. Chair, what I would say was I, I was made aware of these concerns around improper documentation of conflict of interest through the process, the, uh, the whistleblower process and the review by RCGT. That would have been, and had I been aware of these kinds of lapses, you could have been assured the organization would have been moving quickly to fix them. And I think the, you know, the point that has been raised by the Auditor General, which was there was a range of activities undertaken. They I weren't sufficient that I have to catch time. So yeah. when Sorry. Andre Lise Mateau, who under, got $44 million in her time as director into companies she had an equity interest in, in 2021 received $3.5 million, and in 
Further, in November 2021, after she left the board to join the Infrastructure Bank board, in her cooling off period, her company received another eight and a half million dollars. Did anyone inform you of that kind of corruption? I, I was, I am not, well, Mr. Chair, I was not aware of these, of these activities. Thank you very much. Could you have the floor that, for five minutes, please. Does he need to get the money back? You'll have another round, Mr. Dejali, Mr. Perkins, you have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, um, I guess, uh, Mr. Dejali's question, I'll just give you a second, a brief second. Are we going to get the money back? I think as regards the question of recoveries, we, w that is an area we think is a priority. We think we need that there needs to be action taken to offset those funds to STTC, who should be taking action to recover those, those right. monies. Right, it, it wasn't a priority in the past. So, so uh, I, I'd like to come back to, to um, uh, this relationship with the Assistant Deputy Minister that's been in the meetings. Uh, Auditor General, your report on page 22, th I, I, I take it you, you must have spoken with a number of the directors about the relationship because essentially on the top of the page on page 23 you say that uh, when these votes of conflict were going on either declared or not declared since the assistant deputy minister did not raise any concerns board members assumed that the department was okay that's essentially uh, if I'm fair a summary that there was an implicit agreement in the ambiguity or the silence of the department who was in every meeting? Um, we, we definitely spoke with many uh, past and uh, current board members and, and even the assistant to deputy minister and there was confusion around what the role was. Uh, that was very clear but yes, the board, some of the board members voiced to us that it was an implicit agreement in their mind that nothing had been raised by... Well, I don't think he was there just to eat the chicken fingers. I, I presume he was there to actually be a two-way conduit for both what departmental policy is to make sure they're following the contribution agreements and to report back anything that, that the assistant deputy... I mean, I've served on a number of boards, I would expect, including one crown board. I would, expect that, uh, I would expect that the department, the deputy and the minister, would be informed. In fact, I know in the case of the crown I served on, the minister was very much aware of what went on at every board meeting. Well, I think this is exactly why, Mr. Chair, we made a recommendation that this needs to be clarified and strengthened. And I personally spoke with uh, Mr. Kennedy about about this situation um, as we were we we're closing off the audit. So it's pretty clear in the Conflict of Interest Act uh, and the Conflict of Interest Act, which says uh, for public office holders, which says that no public office holder should make a decision or participate in making decision related to the exercise of an official power. And when almost half of the money going out the door is conflicted amounts that government appointed board members. That is not sort of one person leaving the room and, and it's an exception. It's actually the rule. So they're all working in, in getting conflicts and it's a culture that causes a problem. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Kennedy, were you aware that the previous uh, person that was on there, ADM Noseworthy, had asked a previous chair while he was serving as an observer on the board, had asked the previous serving chair for a job? Mr. Chair, I'm, 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 I'm not aware of these allegations. I'm if, sorry, if I'm not in a position to If your to ADM was them. asking a chair for a job while supposedly uh, observing any wrongdoing, do you think that would compromise their ability or willingness to report wrongdoing in the board? Mr. Chair, I would just say I am not, this is the first I'm hearing in this allegation. I, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable responding to hypotheticals, especially not about a former employee, but I am not aware of this allegation. It's the first time I'm hearing of it. Okay, but it is not appropriate for a government official serving on a Crown Corporation board as an observer to ask, the, ask that board chair for a job. Well, Mr. Chair, I would say there are very clear rules that apply to, to designated public office holders about how they are to comport themselves with regard to future offers of employment. And I'd be happy to, you know, to, well, actually, members would be well aware of those. They're, they're, they're a matter of public knowledge. So okay. I would just so point if to I those. Could, if I've got one last question back to the Auditor minute, General. Mr. Perkins. Pardon me? Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very confused where, uh, from a governance perspective, uh, your report seems to imply that if you declare a conflict because they followed their rules, that somehow that that's not an issue. 
when it's clearly an issue with regard to the SDTC Act, which says no director shall profit or gain from any income or acquire any property from the foundation or its activities. And so when you have almost half the transactions, almost half the money going to board members in companies they have a financial interest in, it doesn't really matter, does it, what the conflict interest of the policy of the board is? What matters is the act and breaking the act of parliament. So I think there's, there's a lot going on here because there is also the, the Sustainable Development Technology Act that requires that the board members have experience and be involved in the, in, that some of them have experience and be involved in the sector. I think that inherently, as Mr. Kennedy pointed out before, will create conflicts of interest, which is why a really rigorous process is needed. I would expect that it's more than declaring a conflict of interest. It's declaring and recusing yourself from any votes and decisions, but I, I agree with the member, Mr. Chair, that the Act also clearly states that no uh, member should have personally benefited, and, and it is a concern, which is why we flagged it in our report about failures that the Board had in respecting its enabling legislation. Perkins, you have the floor for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, last week uh, the former Liberal Minister of Industry, Navdeep Baines, was in Industry Committee testifying on this issue, and he is the minister that's, re he began saying his only responsibility for the Green Slush Fund was actually appointing the directors. So when I questioned him on his five appointments, and that Basharian as chair, Guillaumet, Andre Lees Mitteau, Stephen Kakucher, the former liberal organizer in British Columbia, and, uh, and I'm, the fifth one is a person who, who chaired their governance committee, um, I asked him, uh, if he was aware that all of those folks were basically uh, funneling, shoveling money to their own companies, and he declared amnesia at even appointing them um, and didn't remain aware of anything. Uh, very useless uh, testimony. And then um, when I asked some of the staff, including a former PMO staffer who works at SDTC, I worked at SDC that time. She also declared amnesia. Um, so uh, I guess that's the Canadian version of taking the fifth. So um, what I need to know is why did Minister Champagne not fire any of these directors? I think, Mr. Chair, that's a question probably best put to the minister. I don't, well, you provide I don't... him the advice. But I, I feel, I think it would be better if there's a question about why a minister didn't take a certain action that that I, I, I just... I Did you provide him advice to fire these five? I think, Mr. Chair, as, as, as members will know, deputy ministers don't discuss their advice to ministers, you know, in a, in a public setting. I That's hear that. We're taking the fifth. So I, I want to know then going forward, these five directors feather bedded over 300, maybe almost as far as $400 million to companies they had interests in, financial interests in. I was able to find out through the internet about, on my own, about 150 million of it. It's readily available in public sources. So I want to know going forward in your new world uh, with this, one, we will ensure that we try to get some of that back, and two, that the fund under NRC control will not have business with the companies that these people have already taken a huge amount of money for abusing their public position for their own interest, that they will be banned. Because I don't buy, because there was no chair of this fund in its 20 years before Annette Fischer and that had a conflict. So I don't buy that pe you can't find people to put on the board without a conflict. That's a failure. But I want to know going forward, will you ensure that they no longer get to skim taxpayer money any more from this fund when they've gotten almost $400 million already? I think, Mr. Chair, I would say that we believe that the fundamental structure of this organization is contributed to these problems. The design of the statute is such that people are going to be on the board who are at high risk of conflict. I think the move to the NRC they actually... They don't have to be on proper screening to have a conflict. That's total BS. I, I'm simply noting that, Mr. Chair, that the move to the NRC is, is a major step towards eliminating what is a kind of ongoing So as part of the condition of it moving to NRC, will you make sure, as the deputy, advising the minister that this fund, under its new governance rules, 
they will take direction from you on improving their conflict of interest, will not do business with these companies. So these directors and former directors, liberal hacks and cronies, cannot steal taxpayer money anymore. I think, Mr. Chair, what I would say will be there will have to be and there will be a kind of a consideration of all of the findings of the Auditor General's report, the Ramon Shabbat report. Decisions will have to be made on what to do in cases where, as the Auditor General said, for example, you know, money went out to an organization that, that would not, you know, under the terms of the contribution agreement, normally be entitled to receive it. I will say I am in 100 percent agreement with the need for increased probity and for additional scrutiny. I do have to note, though, just in, in, in response to the, to the member's question, at this point, we don't actually have any evidence of, of deliberate malfeasance, criminality, et cetera. So I oh, think... Oh, look, I have to, I have to, simply, I have to stop, I have to stop just you there. To say, I think I, we have asked that it be turned over to the police. Yeah. That's true, the RCMP. But it's, it's, it's very clear from the evidence, at least $150 million is available on the website. We've had directors admit they sat in board meetings and voted their own money. We have to stop that, at least going forward. You can set the terms going forward that these companies and these individuals that have this interest cannot profit from the taxpayer in this way anymore. M Mr. Chair, I, that has nothing to do with police I, charges. Mr. Chair, I, I, pre I appreciate the member's question. My only point was to say that in order to respond to it, I think there's a measure of due diligence that's needed. In the case of recoveries, the money that was put out to ineligible activities, that's black and white. In the case of companies where there's a conflict, the, the kind of facts on the ground matter. They broke the STTC but Act it, it, and the Conflict of Interest Act. But, but, Mr. Chair, I would simply say that you have to look at each case individually. In the case, for example, of organizations that receive money but weren't necessarily compliant with the contribution agreement, the contractual arrangement between the company and STTC may be such that the company wasn't aware that STTC was coloring outside the lines. Thank they you. may have entered in good faith in an agreement. Coloring outside thank the you, lines. Thank, thank well, you. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you very much. 